Greetings to each of you in your own print worlds, and a very special greeting to Mara Cozzolino for all of her work in putting together um, each of these recordings for us. Um, I have a story for you um, today, um, this evening, this morning, um, Passage Through India, I've titled it Cultural Fusion Through Woodblock Printmaking. Print art in Nepal is visible today almost entirely due to contemporary artists working in Kathmandu. Most of them credit Indian artist and print scholar Seema Sharma Shah and Nepali painter and print artist Uma Shankar Shah. Resolved to launch a printmaking program at Kathmandu's Tribhuvan University, the couple opened Nepal's first teaching studio in 1999 after the donation of an etching press. This recent story of print is so focused on etching, if only because of the economic challenges in cultivating other print modes, and so compelling that I wrote about it for printmaking today last year. But these etching artists also murmured the name of Kabi Raj Lama for his new work in woodcut. When I first met Lama, he was already steeped in the culture of woodblock printmaking, passionately collecting artifacts from his own family history. But Lama's path of painter turned printmaker began in Japan, a journey that was not random. Lama was a high school student. His elder sister, who had studied Japanese, welcomed Japanese friends to their home. Not only did the lilt of their language fascinate Lama, but so too did the art books they brought with them, particularly those on Nihonga. Since then, the aspiring artist had dreamt of Japan. His ticket there hinged on a costly language program that offered a visa for longer stay. In 2010, he departed Kathmandu for Tokyo, what happened afterwards was unexpected. When Lama arrived in Tokyo, he recognized language was the obstacle lying between him and his aim to study painting there. Six months into his Japanese studies, he applied to Tokyo University of the Arts, or Gedai, knowing the Nihonga painter Hirayama Ikuro had long been affiliated there. Lama also knew of Hirayama through his Buddhist paintings from the Silk Road and the painter's visit to Nepal. Lama, however, received a tip that conservation was an easier field in which to enroll. He submitted his proposal to restore a 16th century fresco within the iconic Palace of 55 Windows in Durbar Square, the old kingdom of Bhaktapur outside Kathmandu. But writing kanji for Gedai's entrance exam was daunting and the interview taxing before five professors. Failing the exam and receiving a rejection, some suggested Lama return to Nepal. Disheartened, Lama reconsidered how he might make the most of his two-year visa. Museums were a start between his language studies and a job at the transportation company Yamamoto Unyu, loading deep freeze cargo into trucks in five-hour blocks and later as a dishwasher in a Shinagawa ramen shop. Across Tokyo, Yokohama, and Machida museums, Lama began to develop a feel for Japanese art through viewing Nihonga, yoga, calligraphy, and prints. One of his language instructors recommended an ukiyo-e exhib exhibition at Tokyo National Museum. Unfamiliar with the term and the medium, Lama went. When he first viewed Hokusai's Great Wave, he assumed it was a digital print for its perfect registration. This degree of precision was impossible in manual printing, he surmised, until he detected the layers of color on the paper. The discipline in the execution of the print moved Lama. In another museum, he encountered Munakata Shiko's Disciples of Buddha series and discovered how this artist carved in the same mode, yet rough, bold, not orderly, in Lama's words. Munakata also depicted his image in Tsumi, all it takes, Lama believes, to tell a story. The Nepali artist began to envision possibilities for his own artistic practice. Toward the end of his language studies, Lama applied to the art conservation program at Kyoto University, where his application was also denied. 
With no chance to save money and no other foreseeable path, he prepared to return home. Fortune intervened in Tachikawa uh, between a walk to and from the ramen shop. He had observed a man painting between classes through the window of a night school. He turned out to be the painter Ogawa Tomoji, who welcomed Lama to his current exhibition. Importantly, Lama was also invited to the after party of the exhibition. Ongawa introduced Lama to another artist and to another until the Nihonga painter Kotaki Masamichi took steps to secure formal study for the young Nepali. The language student landed not a painting but printmaking scholarship at Meisei University in the foothills of Ome outside Tokyo. Uya Kazuyoshi, the lithographer at Meisei's head of the School of Art and Design, recognized Lama's potential. Still, Lama claimed no knowledge of print apart from scaled-down potato printmaking at his BFA program at Gatmandu University. Shibuya was concerned learning curve might be too steep. It was steep indeed, as Lama recalls, but spending 10 to 12 hour days in the studio, Lama began to make sense of the new technique. He also started to train in Mokohanga with artist Kimura Shigeyuki, whom some of you have studied with yourselves. And he was finally able to study Nihonga, developing a particular interest in kimbaku or the use of gold leaf. When Lama had discovered Hokusai's wave, he thought he was encountering something entirely new, until he had a revelation working in Mokohanga at the Meisei studio. Pictures he knew intimately from his childhood in Nepal were actually woodblock prints themselves. He pocketed that thought. For Lama, Mokohanga overall wasn't about its water-based polychrome inks that have attracted so many, but for the experience at every stage of its sensory process. How much water, what mix of sumi for desired effect, and how much and what kind of pressure for the bottom. Unlike lithography where so much is predetermined, Lama is able to continually adjust his woodblock image while he prints. He revels in the boundlessness, the sounds, textures, that converge in an energy he finds empowering. Within this mode, Lama values the discipline overall. From start to finish, every detail should be precise, like Hokusai's Paragon work. By Lama's second year in printmaking, he was awarded two assistantships teaching both lithography and mokuhanga, where he learned all the more through student mistakes. He also observed he need only look in the studio trash bins for invaluable materials, high-quality pencils, sketchbooks, and half-used tubes of imported watercolors. Lama's prints subsequently had been selected consecutive years for Machida City Museum of Graphic Arts annual student print exhibition, and he was featured in a two-person show in Kanda. It was at this time that Lama decided to return to Nepal. Lama's conversion to lithography in Mokuhanga unfolded across Tokyo during the months leading up to the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and its aftermath. It wasn't until he landed in a Kathmandu Contemporary Arts Center residency where he was able to process the disaster of impermanence. With neither lithography stones nor a press available to him in country, he leaned into his Mokuhanga training. He carved raw sketches, like Munakata, into medium density fiberboard of the upset haunting him, a series he entitled Tsunami. And this time he printed unnative Lokta paper. Less than a year later, Nepal's 2015 Gorkha earthquake hit where history fell into heaps. The of this loss manifested in another series of Lama's prints exploring trauma through Nepal's fragmented cultural heritage. The difference Lama identified, and this is a quote, is when I was in Tokyo, I did not see the tsunami. The depth of this loss manifested in another series of Lama's prints exploring trauma through Nepal's fragmented cultural heritage.
In Nepal, I felt the big earthquake and saw buildings crumble in front of me. No coincidence during these years that Lama's attention to material culture heightened. When he experienced the revelation of woodblock prints in his own culture while in Meisei's studio, he remembered his grandfather's printing of mandalas folded into squares, woven around with colored threads into a Tibetan design, and worn around the neck as amulets. He took an interest in nag, or snake pictures, old hand-printed posters of the indigenous Newar people of the Kathmandu Valley. These snake pictures served as festival talismans. They are now machine printed, yet adhered to doors and walls with dung, dubo grass, and a rupee coin. At a snack shop in his neighborhood one afternoon, he overheard the telltale rhythm of a brayer over wood and discovered a woman in the back hand printing prayer flags. Flags, of course, are an integral expression of Buddhist life in Nepal. Family still prefers to print from wood blocks, the woman explains. The method is far more economical than the zinc plates frequently used today. Lama offered a tip on how to prepare the block with more precision, thereby allowing her to economize on ink. He acknowledges that in his subconscious a sense of instability persists. A friend, sand mandala maker and monk from Serkang Monastery up the road from Lama's home in Kathmandu's sacred Bodhisattva district, recently mentioned that monastery owned sets of sutra woodblocks. The blocks were carved about 50 years ago at the main Tungboche Monastery in the Everest region of Solokombu, though machine printing has since supplanted the rapid Tumang hand printing tradition. Perhaps the nagging instability Lama felt was one reason he wished to see the blocks. Some confirmation of a tradition that he could appreciate both for its enduring materiality and given his work in Mokohanga for their power of transmitting the gift of image and text too. Lama pushed deeper into the discovery to offer a demonstration for the monks. Monks gathered to observe, some with the knowledge that the monastery had these blocks, while younger monks had neither seen them nor knew what printmaking was. Most of them couldn't have known that the sutra printing industry in Tibet had once been divided into 12 specialties, from tiers of proofreaders of the original copy, editors, woodcarvers, and papermakers, to metal workers for tools, doctors, and tailors to stitch the block covers of wool or felt. Lama arranged a printing space on a low, portable table used for everything from tea to services in the monastery's shrine hall, whereupon monks propped their sutra pages for recitation. The table proved to be much like a Japanese traditional printing table, or tsuridai. The artist laid out his brushes, nori, sumi, baren, and smooth Chinese shuan paper that he had had from a previous printmaking residency in China. The monks were intrigued with the baren, quipping about its use as they ran it over their heads and faces. They marveled at the hake with its bristles of horsetail hair. And they watched the exacting process as Lama applied sumi with a hakobi, dabbed the block with nori, distributed the material with a hake around the block surface, and then dropped a sheet of shuen paper onto the block. Lama had pieced together a verifiable demonstration with these obsolete but hardly unusable blocks, cultural fragments that united in the recognition of a larger tradition of Buddhist expression across Asia. During this intimate exchange, the monks were attentive to a process they'd never witnessed, while for Lama, he drew on a fusion of Tibetan, 
Chinese, and Japanese knowledge to deliver this experience. Lama took in his printing act with particular awareness. How smoothly the printing advanced. How deeply cut the blocks were. How carefully the Tibetan text was carved into the block. Formation of text as proper as the calligraphy Lama's grandfather once inked on thick lokta paper. How deeply cut the blocks were. And how fine the lines were, like ukiyo-e, prompting a kind of reverse revelation where native quality equated with what he revered in ukiyo-e prints. Lama also began to learn of indigenous knowledge that once informed Nepali woodblock printing. A vegetable ink had been used, composed of the leaves of the legume variety and bearing properties that protected the paper from insects. When Lama finished his demonstration, the monks perused the sheets with fascination, and each monk requested his own print from the sutra block before parting. Between the Tohoku and Nepal earthquakes, impermanence had become Lama's lens through which he engaged in daily life. At base, impermanence has pervaded the Buddhist mindset across Asia as it drove to Lama's editions documenting Nepali cultural icons as indistinguishable rubble. More widely, print matter by its very nature is viewed as ephemeral. Fire, a future inevitable earthquake, a climate-changed monsoon could turn the blocks themselves into their own wreckage, as occurred more infamously in World War II across Tokyo, and later during the Cultural Revolution in China, as another example. Still, monasteries preserve and protect wood blocks, swaddled in substantial coverings and shelved like a library in specially designed compartments. Serkong Monastery's blocks lasted long enough for Lama to call upon his artistic training and capture their value both through the process of making and the production of a material result. Lama's immersion in print has enabled a certain permanence through the power of transmission. In other words, through Lama's pursuit of learning, resilience to endure, and commitment to his community, he didn't shed tradition, but bolstered it. His development as an artist stirred awareness of Nepal's rich past, as well as new ways of valuing the tradition, neither only for reproduction nor visual art, or not even for creative performance or spiritual experience alone. But in this extra step for an artist, Lama is seeking a way of connecting contemporary life to transmission from the past. Lama knew that Hirayama Igul had produced a series of paintings depicting the transmission of Buddhism via the Silk Road. Now, Kabiraj Lama, with his own passages through Asia, can confirm that life is a fusion which accretes and cycles.